cloud. Okay. All right. So welcome. Um, it's a pleasure to have all of you. This is a reality check with uh, Rishi. And this is Tuesday. And Tuesday, we are doing a healthcare discussion. And uh, let's talk about some of the issues going on today. And uh, the good news is uh, we are bending it uh, here in the Bay Area. And uh, we are flattening the curve, so to speak. So the uh, lockdown that was uh, enforced, uh, or rather uh, recommended, a few weeks back uh, has the guidelines, I should say, has been working out well for us. And interestingly in the news, I also observed that uh, New York uh, area is also sort of uh, experiencing some pretty good uh, uh, results uh, from their own lockdown. So unfortunately there are four states uh, that haven't uh, enforced uh, shelter in place. And that's, uh, I call it the weak link in the chain in terms of uh, how we can uh, sort of get our economy back on track. And that's, uh, that's been a problem, but hopefully we can, uh, we can get that uh, together and uh, see how we can. Uh, so the big question has been about uh, you know, when exactly and how exactly will we get out from this. Let me just share a slide and that way we can uh, provide some context to our discussion. And here we go. Okay. Okay. So this is our our esteemed panelists today, and I'm I'm very honored to have you all. Uh, so today uh, we have uh, Dr. Daisy McCallum, who's the occupational health clinic at the University of California, Berkeley, and uh, she also happens to be. Uh, the Hospitalist for Dignity Health. I really like that. So thank you, uh, Daisy, for sharing that. And uh, then we have uh, Dr. Rajesh Bell, who's a cancer specialist at uh, Sutter Health. And Dr. Bell is, uh, uh, has been uh, joining us uh, as often as he can. And I really appreciate uh, him taking the time to be part of many of these uh, panel discussions. We also have Dr. Vanessa Oppenlander, who is a formerly, formerly physician at Gardner Family Health uh, Network. And we also have uh, Do Dr. Larry Tigleo, and he's uh, part of the OBGYN Hospitalist uh, Medical Director at Washington Township uh, Medical Foundation. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about uh, Dr. Cody in the county. And uh, so Dr. Cody has a uh, expressed cautious optimism today. And uh, in her press briefing, she was uh, a little positive with the, the numbers that we were observing. And the new confirmed COVID-19 cases in Santa Clara County is stable at about 50 to 100. So we are, we are sort of keeping this in check. But what she said was, and I'm, I'm going to quote you, that we are still probably at the beginning of what is going to be a very, very long marathon here in the county, across the region, and indeed across the country. So that is definitely the way, uh, though, with all the good uh, flattening that uh, we are experiencing with the Santa Clara County curve. And so shelter in place and stay safe. And today we had almost uh, 612,000 cases in America with 48,000 recoveries and 26,000 deaths. And uh, so state leaders and doctors are obviously optimistic about, uh, about the Bay Area and specifically the early moves that we had taken and which has prevented surges. And uh, the big news today, we had uh, Trump, President Trump, who has halted US funding for the World Health Organization. And uh, we are currently conducting the coronavirus review in terms of the funding and all that stuff. And we would love to hear from you on that, uh, possibly. And uh, also, we had uh, our governor, Gavin Newsom, who basically has outlined a plan to stay at home orders and uh, the future, the aftermath. You know, once, once we sort of uh, get everybody back to the so called normalcy, then how will that plan be unfurled? And so I'm glad there is someone, someone who's actually putting together some thoughts into that and we have to come up with a plan and 
And frankly speaking, that was beginning to concern me because we hadn't quite seen that. Uh, and uh, we also have CDC and FEMA that have come out with now with a plan to reopen America. And, uh, and also Dr. Cody is now laying out the steps uh, to, for us to do that as well here in the county. But unfortunately, the nature of this is it's impacting a lot of different startups. Uh, uh, and uh, today I read a report that apparently there are three startups a day that are shutting down in Silicon Valley, which is uh, pretty scary. Not, not a good thing at all. And, uh, and then, you know, and I, what I also hear is that some of the hospitals are not doing very well. You know, they are completely like, uh, there are no patients that are, uh, that are visiting these uh, hospitals or urgent care centers. And this is causing uh, a lot of uh, uh, economic challenges for the folks involved with these uh, hospitals and uh, urgent care centers. And uh, so it looks like there are three criteria that we're looking at that needs to be met before we can reopen society and the economy. And one is we have to ensure that hospitals have enough uh, capacity uh, to treat the virus. We also need more widespread testing and extensive contact tracing as well. And there are some issues with uh, both the areas. You know, when you look at uh, hospitals, having the required facilities, having enough capacity, I haven't seen that as a problem yet. Uh, but the other two areas, when you look at uh, the testing and the contact tracing, you know, we'll talk a little bit about that and uh, see how we can converge upon potentially moving forward with these two areas because there are some significant concerns with both areas. So with that, uh, you know, let's get started. And uh, we'll uh, run through a few questions and uh, and uh, how we'll do this is the, you know, from, uh, from the panelist, any one of you can uh, jump in and provide your perspective. And, uh, and then if anyone feels like adding to it, you're obviously welcome to add to it. And uh, we would like to also not make, we make sure that we're not uh, getting into, uh, into personal questions or questions that pertain to your specific organization and things like that. So we'll sort of uh, watch out for that. So, so let's, I'm, I'm gonna start with something that is uh, uh, emerging today. I posted a video earlier this morning about a patient which has gone viral about how he ended up fighting with coronavirus. And, uh, and essentially his thing was, you know, it's very easy for us to lay down and sort of, we don't have the body strength, we don't have the energy, but we have to, we have to undertake a fight with this because if you lie down, then uh, it's, it's uh, probably not a good thing. And apparently that was an advice that he had gotten from his doctor, you know, as he was sort of uh, the, the virus had gone into his lungs and uh, he looked hale and hearty in the video and he looks like uh, put on quite a good fight. And uh, uh, his doctor said, you should stretch, you should move, you should breathe and you should uh, hold your breath for 10 seconds. So, you know, I would like to start with that. You know, if a patient is afflicted, then what are some of the suggestions that uh, our, our panel would like to, uh, like to recommend? So let's start with that. And, uh, and we can have anyone go first and we can sort of uh, talk through this. Okay, I, I think I can add a little bit as to um, kind of what the overall recommendation and why when you're sick, you should be up and moving around. Um, so I work at in the hospital, I'm in a primary care sports medicine physician. And anytime that a, a virus or some sort of illness affects the lung, and you're lying down in the bed, your lungs are not taking as much air in as if you were to stand up and move it around. And so the lungs act like um, a container that if they're not getting enough air and don't expand, they can kind of stick together at the bottom of the lung. And so your amount of air that you can get in after that process happens um, kind of diminishes or decreases immediately. And so um, for people that are in the bed, we find a whole lot of faster recovery when we give them something called incentive spirometry, where they can pretty much blow into this plastic um, contraption and then you can see a, uh, a valve kind of shoot up that will show the amount of air they're able to 
exhale. And this is sort of like a pulmonary or lung exercise. So by just getting up and moving, you're able to use more of your lung capacity and prevent other things from happening that might worsen your condition. And so that's kind of the overall advice as to why when you are sick, that lying in bed and not moving could potentially make your situation and illness in terms of duration become a lot longer or overall symptoms become worse. Well, that, 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 I like the medical explanation. That makes perfect sense to me. Thank you so much. Sure. Would anyone else like to offer any comments to that? Uh, something that you have observed yourself? Okay, so I think I have this, uh, this it's called, what is it called? Um, I'm just trying to pull this. Let's see if I can do that. Nope, I cannot. It's on my phone and okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll get to it. So, so, you know, from a standpoint of, uh, of uh, the OBGYN, you know, I had a question with respect to uh, pregnant women that uh, are basically now, uh, is there any specific uh, risk for them? Any specific recommendations that, uh, that we are we are making to them, you know, and I would love to hear from uh, Dr. Tiglao on this, this uh, specific topic. Do you have an hour? <laughs> so um, the the data that we have uh, in taking care of pregnant women with COVID nineteen has uh, mainly been um, limited, uh, but we do know that there is an association in the third trimester with preterm labor and um, high blood pressure disorders of, um, of pregnancy. And so um, identifying uh, women who are at risk for, uh, for COVID-19, um, especially in the asymptomatic uh, population has actually become a very important issue in our field. Um, currently in the United States, there, there in, in particularly our region, there aren't, uh, um, a lot of the hospitals are starting to develop testing um, that allows for uh, rapid results. The issue is, is that there is a scarcity of swabs and reagents to run these tests. And so, um, you know, for our pregnant patients, we've, um, you know, the, the rec our, our goal would be to, to test anybody who comes into labor and delivery for, um, for COVID-19, symptomatic or asymptomatic, uh, because uh, our, our pregnant patients tend to be in the hospital for um, longer periods of time. And they, they're often face-to-face uh, -face with our nurses and, and uh, the, their physicians uh, for extended periods of time, sometimes up to three days if we're talking about induction of labor. And so identifying these patients has uh, become um, very, uh, one of the more important issues that we're working on. Um, it seems that there's minimal, minimal risk of transmission to newborns. Um, we haven't seen any cases of those, um, and uh, you know there there have been some case studies looking at antibodies in uh, fetal blood, um, and and they've shown to be some some COVID nineteen antibodies. But in terms of uh, long term effects, there haven't been very many. Um, the most important thing for our pregnant patients right now is to limit exposure. Um, it, because of the scarcity of data, um, it's really hard for me to to say that it's safer or unsafe. But um, I think taking the conservative approach is appropriate um, in in this case. Um, we've gone as far as trying to limit the number of exposures that our um, pregnant moms have with regards to coming to the hospital. Um, we're trying to uh, bundle appointments, um, ultrasound appointments. Um, and we've had some success with doing that. Uh, and yeah, I mean, the, the main thing is just, uh, is just limiting your contact at this point. And that's that's the, the main recommendation. And then for, for the staff at our hospital, um, you know, I medical director for, for uh, the OB hospital service uh, at, our, at our hospital. And, and I think the most important, uh, the second most important thing besides protecting our patients is, is actually to protect our staff and so um, we are we are very um, we've been very uh, aware and, and sending 
sending our staff home if they have any sort of symptoms or signs of illness. So uh, do you see, uh, and I would love to hear from uh, all of you, you know, do you see staff members falling sick in a hospital environment? And, and corollary question is, uh, do you see a little bit more of that lately compared to normal? So any specific thoughts you would like to share with this? I think from, from my standpoint, um, our hospital has taken a very active approach of identifying um, staff members who may have symptoms. And um, they're directed to a clinic um, that's on our campus that's away from the main hospital for testing. And there are uh, these, and until the testing's back, these, um, these employees aren't um, allowed to work. Yeah. And so I think there's been some success in, in limiting exposures um, and making the environment safer. Um, but I, you know, what, we're, what we're starting to see is that there are, um, there's a large, or, or not, I wouldn't say a large population of asymptomatic COVID carriers, but uh, there, there are more people who are carriers that, that don't have symptoms that, that we are not testing at this time, so. Yep. So I would like to add that in our hospital, I think a couple of people have contracted COVID, but not in the hospital. They had a community uh, contagion. So they were not in the hospital, uh, but, but overall very well controlled. I think it's to do, I think more with the state policy and then of course the hospital's policy. And between the two, I think California and the hospitals in California have been uh, better off than other parts of the country and the world. Yeah. Okay, great. I think uh, we're in a really unique um, place in that, uh, you know, even with social distancing, I remember when, when uh, we start, first started hearing about COVID in January. And uh, just from my experience, um, of you know, just simple things like going to the store. I mean, there were people that were wearing masks and starting to self-quarantine early, even before the state instituted this. And so, I think I think in some in some way, the self-awareness of where we are in the world actually helped, um, even before the state started making uh, 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 shelter-in-place orders. So, I just go yeah. ahead. Matt. I was just going to say what I think is a game changer, and at least for the facilities that I work in, is that 15-minute test or Abbott test, because that has been monumental in patients that have symptoms that could overlap with seasonal allergies or with just cutting over a different viral infection or something totally unrelated, and we're able to test in 15 minutes whether or not they're positive or negative and that um, we've looked at a cohort of about a month's worth of patients and we tested them side by side with that particular test as well as the one that's a send out and you get in 48 hours. And we found 100% um, congruity between the two different tests. So that is absolutely gonna be the key in going forward in reopening various different businesses as well as mass effects if we're able to diagnose really quickly and have a result of a positive or negative individual. That, that is very en encouraging. So we have these, uh, because it was just about maybe like uh, 10 days back when I heard about the Abbott uh, Labs five minute testing and sounds like it's already now uh, gone out and we have access to these uh, test kits. I would say that there's certain hospitals uh, that have access to it, but it's not widespread. Um, and that is largely in part with a lot of different things, even from a federal level. So I know uh, from the talks that I've had from the University of California side, um, that we have been working with the state officials and trying to become it more widespread and available to every type of discipline and hospital and outpatient care. Because that's going, we want to protect everybody, not a specific subset. Okay, uh, that's good to know. So Dr. Oppenlander, uh, my question for you was related to PPP. And, uh, you know, do you do, is there still a shortage of PPP or we are sort of beyond that now? You know, what have you seen lately? I, I work in an outpatient clinic and we, um, we reuse regularly 
So, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, yeah, I mean, they, they keep telling us that they are not able to order more and they are waiting and we just kind of are very careful. Everybody screen before they come in. So we know when we have to use them and when we don't, and we're very cautious with the use of them so that we know that they survive till we need them again. Yes, and it seems like uh, you know there is a lack of coordination between the between the federal uh, government and also some of the states. For example, our Governor Gavin Newsom had to basically go out and order some for our state, and what he declared was we couldn't wait anymore. So that has been a challenge, and it's something we have to address uh, as we move forward. And, uh, but I would like to go back to something that Dr. Tiglio said, and uh, which is, uh, you know, the data, you know, I, th I think we're all sort of data driven and uh, we would like to uh, have access to the right type of data so that we can make the proper medical choices. But uh, for the lack of data, because there are not enough cases, uh, you know, typically the volume provides you uh, the insights, you know, volume of cases provides you the insights so what kind of your sharing is happening right now in the, in the industry in terms of uh, you know, sharing what's going on in Italy or in China or even in South Korea? And how is that, is that happening right now in terms of how we are converging this data? You know, what is the process for that? You know, do you have to actually go out and hunt for this type of information? Or you know, I'm just trying to understand that a little bit. Well, my experience is that I feel frustrated because most of the data that I get is from the same sources everybody else is getting. I mean, it's the CDC, it's, yeah. you, know, you can look in medical journals, but most of it's case studies and it's, it's not coming out fast enough. So you have to kind of rely on, um, I, I rely heavily on the CDC and their information. Because I don't know, I, I have a big concern that a lot of the information that is out there that gets published in the regular papers that people start talking about, then you listen to people talk and they interpret it, and it's the same information I was giving, but it's being interpreted in a very different way, and it becomes urban myth so quickly. Um, and I, so I'm constantly trying to just go back to objective data and share that with people and try to get them to not jump to conclusions, because I think there's a lot of that that happens. And, and I think the data that is coming at us is coming from the press and, mm -hmm. uh, and from various sources. Like today I saw something and I ended up posting that on Facebook and then I, it, that posting was flagged. And this has been uh, uh, validated as uh, data that is uh, not correct or something, some message like that. You know? So I think I'm glad Facebook has an algorithm that is screening these types of postings, which is probably very healthy for America but uh, you know, I'm still kind of concerned with the, you know, the the proper the kosher sources of data for not just our our medical professionals, but also for for people, right? So, and to some extent, what I'm seeing is we have to rely upon the press. Any any thoughts on that? Uh, anyone would like to share? <laughs> I think the press is scary. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's I think it's actually really interesting how um, medical data was disseminated. So I, my when when COVID nineteen hit Italy, I was actually very very um, uh, my attention was brought to the forefront by actually one of my uh, colleagues who I I did a medical student exchange with, uh, who's an OBGYN in Italy. And uh, he, he wrote me a message saying, this is, you know, this is um, going to be a lot bigger than it is right now. And you really need to brace yourself. And so, um, and, and I've, I've found that throughout this whole process um, that it's actually my colleagues who are in other places that, we, that, that are helping me. And then, I'm, you know, I'm helping them, for instance, my, um, you know, some, some folks that I did residency with that are in New York, and then others who I, I've worked with that uh, work in New Orleans and Alabama, um, you know, we're all sharing this data, and, um, you know, some of the pre-publication numbers that are out there. Um, I know that, you know, speaking towards how the press covers um, this information, 
um, it's, it's really interesting because if you look at social media, um, I remember reading about hydro, hydrochloroquine and azithromycin, and, and there's a, there's a pre, uh, pre-publication paper that came out uh, looking at that. And, and I was like, where did this come from? And then the next day, the president's talking about it. And, I, you know, and then it becomes, and, and then it, um, I just don't feel like it had been uh, appropriately vetted through all the, the proper channels. And so yeah. you know, the press does have some responsibility. Um, but I think you know, at that point, you know, they are grasping onto anything that may help us gain control of this uncontrollable situation that we found ourselves in. And so I think that's kind of what's been driving the media. Um, and, uh, you know, until, until we get, get a grip on it, then, you know, it, I think this is going to continue where it's kind of like rumors flying. And, I heard and, this works, but maybe this doesn't work. And, you know, you, there are people that are sending out pictures of, of patients being proned in different positions in the ICU, um, how, to, how to use two ventilators to, to ventilate a patient or one ventilator to ventilate two patients. I mean, there are all kinds of hacks that are being shared. And it, it's just really uh, an interesting time to be a doctor. Because... Yes, absolutely. And uh... So going back to, you know, I just want to make a point with the press, uh, you, know, at, at, you know, they have to strike a balance. On one hand, you know, when you get a piece of information, you have to release it quickly because the one that does it fastest gets the most uh, uh, ratings and all that good stuff, you know, the, the number of hits to your website. So obviously they're trying to stay relevant, trying to stay in business. And so there is a sense of urgency, but at the same time, they have to balance it out with some sort of a discretion. There is no easy answer in terms of you know how they could uh, go about doing that, and they are they are sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place, and uh, obviously economically, I think every strata of society and every industry vertical is going to be challenged. So everybody is sort of scampering to see how they can stay relevant. It's it's a tough choice, but uh, but I think you know it sort of falls upon CDC, and uh, you know CDC should have a mechanism of sharing this information with the doctors uh, nationwide. And my, my sense is they are probably, they have not been very effective based upon the whole debacle with the test kits. So it seems like CDC has to be revamped uh, quite a bit. And then uh, today I hear that, uh, that Dr. Fauci, Fauci might be on his way out and uh, not at this point of time, but it sounds like there is a conflict playing out and which is not very good because this is like we need all hands on deck. And uh, so I would love to see if any of you want to make a comment on this or, you know, I'm happy to move on because I think some of these questions might be a little controversial. So if you don't want to talk about it, I'm happy to move on. No, they're not controversial. It's uh, clearly ridiculous, frankly, because some of what the uh, press latches on to is what they hear from the top government um, in the country and frankly, uh, cutting off the uh, funding to WHO and talking about firing a doctor in the front line is not productive. It's, it's, it's like uh, trying to take away the funding of a fire department when there's a forest fire going on. Correct. So I personally think that uh, somebody needs to put a governor on this cart uh, frankly, and get this uh, in a little bit of control uh, somehow or the other, because we've le learned, and I think some some governments have learned the hard way. Uh, let's look at England. They learned the hard way when they decided to have this bizarre policy of letting the virus run its course and not uh, um, control it, and they have a phenomenal increase in deaths. The prime minister of the country himself got ill, and I think he's tempered his message somewhat. So I'm not wishing ill on anyone, but I really think that somebody needs to temper their message and their actions. Otherwise, there are consequences. And, um, and unfortunately, there may not be any political consequences, but the rest of us uh, might suffer. So that's something I don't think is controversial. It's simple, simple logic. It should not happen. I, I, I must say I have to agree with Dr. Bell. I think what's hard is... Well, I'm not looking at the page properly, but the gentleman that's working in the OB hospital, sorry. <laughs> um, the, the collaboration that happens between physicians is much more 
almost effective. And like, if you look at like the different medical school sites, like Johns Hopkins has been really good about, you know, keeping up date information and it's non-political. And when that, that there's some way of trying to bring that kind of, you know, like work effort and maintain that, you know, into the CDC. It's, it's hard though, because the CDC is a governing body, right? And so they've got other, I don't know what you want to call it, forces coming at them, but if they don't allow collaboration well is, is my viewpoint. And it, so you kind of have to work on the outside of them and work around them, but they still, you know, have sometimes ultimate say, and that makes it hard. Because they're the ones that, you know, said we couldn't use test kits that the WHO was using, right? I mean, and that, that's something we couldn't really work around. We weren't allowed to do that. Or when, you know, the WHO had a PPE standard and the CDC set, had, came out with one that was less, um, less protective of healthcare workers. You know, that, that to me was a sign that the, the CDC was behind and, um, and, and that we were, you know, in terms of the amount of PPE that we had in the country, we were in trouble. Well, and it's hard not to think that some of that is, this is going to sound super political, but capitalistically driven and not really focused on patient care and knowing, you know, like in that case, that you have to have your providers cared for so you can take care of the patients and get the politics out of it. Correct. I think it's I, just I, very, very, go ahead. Yeah, I, well, I was just going to say that we've been taught from kids and with parents and how you're up, up brought but whenever there's a news report, I think the natural tendency of the population is to accept it as truth. And when you are talking about health, where you are trying to interpret results, that's what makes the truth kind of blurred. And what I think that is important for people out there who are listening to the news about certain treatments and certain things that are going on is to listen to a whole bunch of different sources. You know, sources that are coming from, let's say, if you want to bring politics, a left wing, a right wing, something that's international. And then before sort of implementing that in your brain as truth, to ask you know, your local primary care physician or doctors that you're close in contact and getting their take on what exactly is happening because your truth is only what you're being exposed to. And that is why sharing of information is so important in something like a pandemic because everyone's perspective does add to the overall equation. And so for those that are listening, I mean, I think that the news is a great source of information to inspire questions that can be answered by those that have them. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. Anyone wants to add anything else on this? It's a very interesting topic. Well, and I was just I was just thinking about the whole capitalism piece and how hospitals, even within this area, are fighting each other to try to get rapid testing in their in their in their hospitals. I mean, it's very capitalistic. It goes, you know, it, it's sad. It's almost like the very future, the very future of the hospital is sort of contingent upon doing a few things. Because I think we are sort of teetering on the edge, you know, and uh, and uh, nobody wants to go beyond that tipping point. So you're scampering and doing all you can. So which brings me to to like uh, you know to some extent we are talking about a social net, and with all the bailout uh, talks, you know, we have had many uh, discussions uh, on this particular podcast. Uh, we are doing small business town hall meetings. Uh, we are doing, um, you know, various uh, topics of discussion that have come up, uh, even in terms of uh, like uh, uh, SBA loans or, you know, uh, about uh, evictions and uh, about county programs, uh, you know, things like that. So there are different issues that are impacting and everything sort of boils down to having a social net, which we can fall back upon. So what about healthcare? You know, do you see that uh, we are sort of converging to, to that social net with healthcare because it seems like you know, our, we don't have our act together uh, either at the, at the federal level, obviously we don't have our act together, but also with the, all this uh, sort of the, the push for capitalism that is driving to, to make profit and stay relevant, 
is also driving a lot of different uh, decision makings at these different hospitals. Any, any thoughts on that? Anybody would like to talk through? Well, I was just going to say that all throughout medical school, the number one risk factor for anything was low socioeconomic class, okay? And that because of not having access to healthcare, or that's how you're being brought up in terms of not relying on, I guess, people that are able to give important information on their health can relate to long-term chronic diseases. And that's what primarily the problem is having in a subset of the minority populations not exclusive to African Americans, but pretty much there's a, there is a natural trend for those that don't have that access, have more chronic comorbidities or chronic illnesses, that when they're being exposed to something like the coronavirus, and this time it's coronavirus, who knows what the next couple of years or you know decades might bring, but those are the going to be the individuals that are going to be hit the hardest. And I love the idea of certain states, including California, trying to bring light to that through studies and sort of creating a open mind and um, need for this sort of being able for everyone to get treated and be seen before they get any illnesses to begin with, because that's how we're gonna change and shape society in the future. Unfortunately, we can't do anything about the past, but trying to allow a system in which everyone can be seen and everyone can be treated is going to be the solution to all our, you know, all, all, all of that actually. And, you know, while socialistic medicine has, you know, its downfalls, it does have its benefits as well. Yep. So Dr. McCallum, I would like to point out, you know, very early on, and I was actually quite uh, struck with this message when U.S. Health and uh, Human Services Secretary Alex Azar, you know, he was uh, talking about vaccines and how they might not be affordable. And so, but he completely dismissed this idea that uh, we would make it available for every citizen in, in the United States. And uh, what he sort of implied was that poor people may not have access to vaccination. So how would that work in America, you know, where uh, so someone who is able to afford it will be allowed to have it and they can go out and be a functional part of the economy, whereas somebody who doesn't have it, you know, will uh, basically be afflicted and be passing on that to others. And, and perhaps uh, with some tag systems that we might have, they may not be able to be part of the uh, economy and be earning members of the economy, right? So it, it imposes lots of different challenges uh, on, on society. And I feel that we are sort of moving forward with a better plan for America, you know, which is not the plan that we have today. Yeah, I think if they, if the, if the, the, this capitalistic country doesn't see sense and keeps on making it uh, healthcare a uh, complete free for all, we're really going to find that the capitalism in this country is going to suffer. And we're going to see other countries that have a more social approach to healthcare will have the healthy citizens who can run a healthy economy and will take over. And we will realize that uh, we were actually anti-capitalist in the long run. So it really doesn't make it, we'd be shooting the foot. So I really think that it's a, uh, to not look after the health of your own citizens is certainly not a very capitalistic thing. It's like, uh, if you don't pay your people enough, they can't buy the goods you produce, and you can keep living on debt forever, or try to think that you could live on debt forever, but sometime it's gonna to come to a grinding halt and you're gonna to have to pay the piper. So I really think that this is a very poor investment to even suggest that uh, a thing like a vaccine would only go to the people who afford it and to make that prediction even before we have an effective vaccine because we don't even know if we'll have an effective vaccine. Vaccines are not very effective. Um, viral vaccines have not been always been very effective. Yeah, great points, great points, Dr. Bell. And uh, so I, I think, uh, you know, I'm sort of uh, getting to some key conclusions from this conversation and not very specific to the, uh, the inner workings of the medical industry, 
but more in terms of policies, you know, because I think uh, we need to have the ability to share data. We have to make it a lot more easier, a lot more accessible for our community. In fact, uh, the ability to share data across the world and, and it's probably falls upon the World Health Organization to create an infrastructure to, to manage this and also to allow us to basically sift through uh, data that is uh, not right, that is actually planting fear, for example, whereas data that is authentic. And so we need to, we need to uh, figure out a solution on that. And secondly, uh, the pandemic preparedness has been a challenge, we all know that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but that is the second component of what I talk about. You know, I think we need to fix that as well. And then CDC needs to be sort of uh, completely revamped and uh, repositioned for success down the road because these pandemics, uh, it, it might become a, a frequent event. I mean, we are seeing this after 100 years, but what happens if this itself comes back uh, later next year or even later this part of the year? So we need to be better prepared. And uh, we need to think of uh, like that social net with respect to healthcare as well. You know, we can look at greed dominating our actions or, or a capitalistic outlook that is dominating our actions. But we need to sort of look at how we can create an ecosystem that will work for every American uh, person here in the United States. And uh, for example, South Korea, you know, they did, uh, I don't know, like millions of uh, testing. They had drive-through testing they perform much better with a single payer program that they have there. So that's something that we need to work on, which brings me back to the kits, you know, so let's see. So I hear that, uh, and this was, uh, I sort of touched upon it in the very early part of our discussion, that uh, the kits are sort of coming into the market and we heard from Dr. McCallum as well that we have the kits, but uh, the kits I hear are not being put to use. Like I hear of a hospital in Seattle that has tens of thousands of kits sitting there but nobody's coming out to test it. So what's the distribution model? And any, any specific thoughts on that, you know, in terms of uh, what's going on with these kits? Oh, that's probably part of the hospital policies and administration, something that they don't tell us physicians. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I can't really say, you know, uh, I know that they have kits, but sometimes the supplies are not there. Um, you know, I think that they have them, they'll want to use them, but, I, you know, that is definitely not on the frontline level, but more on the administration level is my guess. To some extent, am I right in this, that there are two types of kits? You know, one is uh, that uh, something that the CDC is sending out, and then we have the Abbott, Abbott Labs kit. So one is like a, a public health care kit, and the other is a private health care kit that is probably a little bit more expensive. Is that right? Or well, I know that Stanford has their own kind of testing labs. I think though for the, the, the biggest problem was that the CDC only wanted the United States to use their testing capabilities. And you know, when that plan got squashed, it opened the doors for all these private labs as well as um, you know, for-profit companies to come up with their own um, level of testing. And that has been uh, very good in trying to I guess, mitigate the situation by identifying those that are infected with COVID-19 or are not. So, um, you know, I only can hope that there's more studies and more testing that's being done to develop newer, quicker, more available testing for various different hospital groups. Um, you know, here in California, it's Kaiser. In Minnesota, it's Mayo Clinic. You know, so they're all coming up with different ways of trying to do this, including the antibody test as well, to find out those that have demonstrated some sort of immunity. And that's being rolled out very slowly in the West Coast, as well as going towards the East Coast. So um, it's a work in progress, I would say, for so I was yep. going to say that there are two kinds of kits. So the main, uh, there's two kinds of tests, basically. One is whether or not the person is shedding the virus. So it's a PCR-based test where you're looking for the nucleic acid and amplifying it. So the thing with that is you, those kits were in short supply. The turnaround time is slow because you've got to amplify the DNA. It's also a somewhat expensive test, and that was the initial test. Now, all the companies are coming out with rapid tests, which are mostly antibody-based tests. Now, the, eventually, I think part of the thing is people don't know what to do with a rapid test because you could have an antibody, but you could still be shedding the virus. 
And initially, some of the test usage was limited to people who had symptoms, partly because there was not, there were not enough tests, kits. So I think eventually when one has a testing capability and one knows what the, as we call them in medical parlance, what the sensitivity and the specificity of each specific test is, I think they're going to combine two tests. A, to find out whether or not the person is infectious. Can they spread the virus? And number two, whether or not they are immune and therefore less at risk for getting the infection if they were to go out into the open. So I think that eventually what, uh, for example, a, an entire healthcare system in India, and which is technically a third world country, for example, I read Max Hospitals, 15,000 employees, each of those employees that's going to get tested in the next few days to know who is not infection, going to infect anybody and who is now immune. So that's the kind of level of testing we need. And that's not a decision that uh, an individual doctor is going to make. And as um, the previous speaker said, it's going to be a decision made by either a state healthcare authority or a, that will dictate terms to hospitals to do that or it's going to be at a national level. But I don't foresee it happening as quickly in this country as it is even in countries like India and Korea and Japan, where uh, this is much further along. Yep, I agree. And- uh... From a primary care standpoint, it was um, never clear to me why we weren't able to get any of the test kits. We weren't able to go through Quest Labs um, I never got clear answers, and we were always just told, it, it, concerning, we send them to the hospital. And uh, I don't know that that was, I mean, I don't know if that's the right decision, but I do think that just like, you know, when you do a rapid flu test or you do a rapid strep, I mean, your, your goal is to try to stop people where they're at, not to keep them <laughs> going out and impacting the hospital, like for testing people, that, that seemed to me the wrong way because then, you know, then they still have to go home and quarantine themselves because they're ambulatory. It's not like we're sending the ones that are, yeah. It, it, I, I, I feel like the future requires something like that, but I think the hard part is, is you cannot predict what the next one could be. And even if we're prepared to know what we need to do, will we have the scientific capability to actually do that with whatever comes at us next time. Um, I don't know, I think it's wrong as it may be to some people in America. I think South Korea did the right thing when they quarantined people. They came up positive, you get to go over here. You don't get to move about anymore. And I think we did a good job in the Bay Area, but I think that that hard, it's hard to do in America, but that's a good way to control something. Yeah. yeah. So South Korea did something else right. And uh, that brings me to contact tracing. And we all know about patient 31 in South Korea and how that patient 31 ended up infecting 1,200 people. But South Korea was able to conduct some very good contact tracing and they basically quarantined everybody. Mm -hmm. This is something which is currently lacking here in America. It's still lacking. I mean, we are, you know, we are probably the, the most affluent nation in the world. And uh, our healthcare system has really fallen short. It's pretty apparent to everybody. So, so now I see that, okay, let's move forward. Okay, okay, it, it, we don't have it today, but Google has built out an application that will provide contact tracing. And as long as we uh, allow the app to, to track our, our set of activities and, and where in our locations, right? And in case we visit the doctor's office and if there was, some, a patient at the same time who was afflicted with coronavirus, then you will be triggered a notification that, okay, looks like you have been exposed, so you have to quarantine yourself. And, uh, you know, so I think the state of where we are, it's probably a good thing from my perspective. But then Amer America has lots of privacy concerns that uh, perhaps uh, some of the other countries in the world may not have. How will we get through this? Because we need to have contact tracing how will we ever get this economy back on track? You know, and that's beginning to concern me quite a bit. So how do we balance that out? And how do we address the privacy concerns of citizens? Any, any thoughts, anybody? I think the citizens are less concerned about privacy than some of the organizations that are imposing privacy uh, regulations, frankly. 
some of the HIPAA regulations I find are pretty ridiculous, uh, to put it simply. Uh, you know, a lot of the patients would like to share information yeah. and would like to be part of a, a large, um, you know, they go to support groups, they shout about their illnesses. And uh, we have all these sort of uh, funky regulations that come into play. Correct. You can't talk about this and that. And then, of course, there are a bunch of lawyers. Because one of the other, other problems is most of the world's lawyers are concentrated in this country. Yes. So between them and some of these regulations, they use these regulations to create lawsuits where none should exist, frankly speaking. And that thwarts a sharing of information. And, um, you know, it, it, it's funny in a world where, you know, I, I can tell you one thing, Google knows everything I do. <laughs> They're probably Absolutely. watching everything I do. Uh, Facebook probably knows um, more than they should know about me. And then this HIPAA comes into play and say, you know, you can't uh, dictate this because somebody God forsaken may hear what the patient's age is, you know, or may hear what the sex is or sexual orientation. I, 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 I really find it quite ridiculous to, uh, frankly speaking. And I understand that this, a zeal to protect privacy, but it's, I think it's more from, not from the individual patient where it comes from some regulatory organization that has decided. And I really think that there's some money to be made in this, uh, in this uh, monkey business, to put it very uh, undiplomatically for a healthcare uh, physician. Right. And to some extent, I think uh, some of these policies that get rolled out, they are catering for a very specific segment of society but there is no way for us to understand the larger American sentiment before we roll out a, a certain policy. So, and, and for the, and so now talking about policy enforcement or policy rollout, you know, for the most part, a lot of uh, people, a huge segment of the population is really disengaged. So they don't know what policies have been implemented until it actually hits them. And so with the HIPAA policies, for example, now we are seeing how this would impact the contact tracing and how do we go out and enforce it. And, and Dr. Bell, you make a very good point because even if you turn off your phone and people have conducted experiment, even if you turn on the phone, Google is still able to track where exactly we were and all the different points of location are still included in the, in the very specific phone. And, and you can, you can look that up. So I, that I find it very useful when I'm filling out my timesheet. <laughs> No, no, but I, but I tell you what, I it's not just uh, it, it's not just those. But the thing is that you could be engaged. I tell you, there's no point in a in a person getting being engaged in policies and politics if every politician is influenced by lobbyists. So it really doesn't matter what I say. If HIPAA is going to make a lot of money for some regulatory body, and they've got some lobbyists in the government, it doesn't matter what I feel about it. It really doesn't matter. And eventually I say, you know, screw it. I don't care about what you're going to do. Just do what you have to do. Let me go along with my business. And I think that kind of um, apathy sets in. Unless the person who is following policy can actually influence it, the common person, and really influence it. And, and it's not just if I any policy, whether it's drug prices or it's uh, distribution of health care or it's... Uh, uh, insurances and 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 uh, insurance companies and uh, even your hospital in your area. If you really are, uh, if you don't see yourself having any impact, and if a, a lobbyist is able to influence a lawmaker and and entirely uh, influence every decision in the favor of big business, then the general public gets disengaged eventually. And I think that's something that. Every that that, and that needs a, a a really broad look as how we can how we can uh, reset that. And I was wondering, this is one time to reset a lot of things, and one of those things is this. I think it really speaks to the um, you know uh, contact tracing and privacy. You know, it, it brings back you know with with our country and and the values that this country is founded on. I hate to be, you know. To go back to that, but I think about um, just um, it, th there's just a, a cultural, you know, there, there's a whole section of America that's all about personal liberty, and you know, what th and that's what they believe this country was founded on, and I, and there are those of us who are like, well, we're going to do the the best 
good, the most good for the best number of people, you know, I'm, I'm okay with you tracking me. And so um, I think there, there really is a, a culture clash that, that is at the root of this, that, um, you know, if you get the right person delivering the message that this needs to happen, I think you, you, you end up with, um, you know, folks from different regions of, of the United States going along with this. And um, it, it, right now, it's just so disjointed, the, the messages that, that uh, people are getting from their politicians um, and their leaders, are, and, and it, it, you know, it can be confusing for, for those who you know, are just used to following. Um, but, but I can tell you, and I see this in, in how we drive, you know, it, you have people that, you know, you go to Europe and everybody hangs out in the right lane and you only use the left lane to pass. Here, you can hang out in the left lane and go as slow as you want because this is America and, you know, this is my my personal liberty. Don't infringe on it by by making me switch to the middle lane. So, I, I you know, I think about, you know, privacy and, and in that context of, of, of the values that, that we see here in the United States. So I'm going to be the, on the opposite side of things, um, having deal with, um, you know, a subset of my population where injuries have to be disclosed to the public and how that affects kind of their overall ability to do have a job or um, get drafted. Um, so by giving a power entity the knowledge of whether or not an individual is positive or a, a disease of any kind, there are potential consequences that can result from that if proper measures are not being met. And that could be the loss of, you know, friendships, relationships, um, public positions. Um, it creates the stigmata that, um, that if the word were to get out, there might be some violence. You know, if you get a, uh, um, a signal saying that you've been potentially in contact with somebody that is positive for a contagious disease and somehow you're able to get access to who that person is, even though a private sector says, no, 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 you won't be able to hack through it. Then there, I would be worried that somebody might be taking it out on them or whatnot. And I think that we are, it's a great idea in theory. However, there is some protection stuff that needs to be, and I say stuff because that there is so much more than I'm even able to think about on the spot, but there is some things that I could see being potential problems, not just because I, I want to have my own freedom to privacy, but just what are the consequences should this information get out to somebody that has power over me in some regard and you know being a medical professional if i am labeled and somehow someone finds out that i'm a covid patient i don't know how and i might be clear of the 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 disease or infection i don't know how well i'm going to be received when i come back to work and let's say i have allergies and i start coughing you know i it, it's it's that kind of information that can be scary and so you know i'm kind of on defense on both sides like i think it's great for the rest of you know society and that's how we can try to sequester everybody in being in an area but i do worry about what the consequences are if someone you know should get a hold of that and that's why it's so important that we have relationships with our with our patients that whatever you're going through stays with me it's that and that protective barrier that whatever i say is not i'm not going to release it to your parents to your 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 um, close neighbor or anything like that. You have to give me consent to do so. So I I'd like to sorry. And it's not a it's not a debate, but I really think that instead of uh, protecting information, there should be laws that mis protection cannot be misused. That information should not be misused. It should be the other way around. For example, there's sexual discrimination. I wish there was a way for a person to hide that he's a man or a woman or he's black or white or brown or yeah, whatever color they are. But that doesn't happen. And there is discrimination. So you put laws in place to thwart discrimination. You can't hide everything. I can't hide the fact that I'm a man or woman. You could be in your, um, our doctor here the, could be in his scrubs and he could be attacked by somebody because they say that you are uh, uh, a healthcare worker who could have been in contact with a potentially infected person and therefore you could infect everybody in my apartment where you live. So I think what we need is laws that say that you cannot discriminate 
or misuse that information rather than saying that this information itself should be hidden, frankly speaking. If, you, if all the information were out there, I think there was more discrimination against gays when you hid the fact that they, this person was gay or not. When everybody came out in the open, I think that is what we need. You need a policy that, that prevents you from discriminating against somebody being gay. And same with medical information. You should not be able to discriminate somebody because they have an information. So we really need to fix society rather than be secretive about certain information. And that would be ideal. I know it's not yet ideal, but I think that's the way we need to look at it. We should not allow for somebody to discriminate just because somebody has a, a pre-existing condition, for example. That clause, if you remove, then the pre-existing condition for that person becomes mute. It doesn't matter if you know if I have a, uh, a third testicle, frankly speaking, if uh, it, it doesn't impact my uh, job or anything or, or a ability to get insurance. So I personally think that the information should be out there. Well, I think the problem, if, I don't know, it's a, we're asking for a cultural shift and we've, we've asked our government to create infrastructure to encourage that cultural shift so that we can then, you know, work as we want to as physicians within that, that infrastructure. And it doesn't work perfectly, but I think it's because the cultural shift hasn't really happened, right? And I, my biggest concern with the whole COVID thing is so much of what we've tried to do in, you know, it state by state, and then it's country by country. And I really think that the WHO needs to be kind of everything that we fall back on, because if we don't work together globally and find a way to like, actually interact where you know we're some countries are more private some people countries are more open and we don't find a way to have that dialogue then again the next time whatever does hit us globally we're not going to be able to work together we're not going to be prepared to share that information and find those similarities in the maybe in the infrastructure of the laws that exist that then we can work with or create them i don't know but that I, that's that's my concern is the future is how we allow I, sharing from country to country and state to state because we're very isolated right now i feel i agree yeah, how are we going to undo the damage that's been done <laughs> yeah i know no one's going to trust us yeah so i really think that i agree with the uh, the thing about a cultural shift and if this doesn't for, force us to examine and or the the role everybody plays in society then i think nothing will and then we'll be back to square one. Well, you got people calling it a hoax, you know, so. Yep. Yeah, so I really think that I, I, I personally think that we need um, a really drastic action to really know whether in healthcare, who really matters, how healthcare is administered, what is the role of an administrator, what is the role, relative role of a physician, what is the role of governments, and what is the role of society. I think everything needs to be, this should be challenged and everybody should be thinking about it and there may need to be very big cultural shifts and we should not we should be prepared for it and, and unless we are whether we're going to eat every every little creepy crawly insect anything that moves or are we going to infringe upon the territory of wildlife and what, what really do we want i really think that every country will have to examine cultural practices that may have contributed to this uh, debacle frankly and 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 and, and and uh, address it at their level, whether it was government inaction, whether it was a deep-rooted cultural practice, whether it was a, uh, a tendency to hide by governments what the data was, whatever it is, it needs to be explored and it needs to be set right. Otherwise, we'll be having this discussion again after hours, you know, after the next the pandemic. Yeah, that's right. We'll you be won't be active. alive, actually. You'll have to find some other panelists. <laughs> So uh, let's see if there are any questions, you know. Samira, do you have any questions uh, you would like to ask? Uh, Samira, you're on mute. So if you can, you can unmute yourself and yeah, ask questions. Yeah, I'm fine. Um, well, I am so grateful to listen to all of you. It's really wonderful information. It's good and sometimes it's scary, but it's really things that... Uh, it's important for us to hear. And one thing only I would like to say is, 
I wish that there was no politics in human health and yes. in pandemic and it should be like all focused on patients and to make them feel better and for entire country to heal and move forward from this. I don't like what happened sometimes from politics. I mean, we need to take care of the human being first. That's Correct. my opinion. Probably I'm wrong, but I mean, that's how I feel. When yeah. someone needs ventilation or they need to take care of them, they're sick. That's what, what's important, what's count, and what everybody needs to focus on. The people's health. We all deserve to receive a good um, service or if we need tests should be provided for everybody if, if everybody needed. I don't know if we need everybody, if we all need to be tested that I haven't heard one side yet, which one is the right way to do. Um, probably I think the people that um, they need tests to be tested would be the one that they're feeling some sickness. I give them priority than, than myself when I am not uh, having the symptoms. So, I mean, it's always good to hear from you guys. Great, Samira. Good insights. You know, it's seemingly to summarize, you know, when we are politicizing healthcare, that's a very sad yeah. day. Yeah, it is. We have to get away from that. Let's yeah. go to uh, Somnath. Somnath, Mitra, do you have anything to ask? Uh, yeah, so good morning from India. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Yes, so quickly I was listening to the debate and the discussion and uh, we are also in the same situation and uh, uh, we are really, really catching up on the public health care technology and the required governance attention, catching up. Uh, luckily, uh, you know, the system is working to an extent, to an extent and qualifying. Uh, of course, uh, the economy is now uh, uh, quite a focus. Uh, economy needs to be a little kick-started. This is a large economy with very, very big number of people. And uh, that has to be also, you know, the government is working on this. Each of the federal governments are working on this. Uh, you know, we will tide over. We shall overcome. Absolutely. Well said. Well said. Let's go to Laura. Laura, you have anything to ask our panel here? Thank you for joining us, all of you. Yeah, I don't have any questions, although I, I keep tuning in. Um, we are a uh, sandwich generation. I have an older aging mom who lives by herself, and we have three teens in our home. So we're trying to navigate keeping everybody safe. And um, so I think I and mostly trying to stay abreast of asymptomatic carrier situations and always trying to understand the ever moving <laughs> target of information um, in terms of asymptomatic carriers and making sure we're not passing it on to each other or especially to my mom. Yep, that's the, that's the concern that all of us have. And, uh, and uh, that's, why, that's why my wife and I, when we take a walk around the neighborhood, you know, we, we started putting masks around us and, uh, and then it, was, it became very uncomfortable. We're not used to it yet, but I can guarantee you this, that in a few months, we'll all sort of get used to it as, you know, we get back to normalcy and we are going about to the malls or wherever else and we'll all be wearing masks. We'll have to get used to it. By the way, Laura and I, we, we collaborate uh, to see how we can help our neighbors. We are part of the neighborhood pandemic preparedness team and we are essentially helping neighbors with their groceries, with medication, Anything else they need? We also have lots of folks who have jumped in to build uh, masks. And so far we have delivered about 2,500 masks to the Bali Medical Foundation. And uh, it's pretty amazing because I think in spite of all the inadequacies of American healthcare, you know, what is just very uplifting is how the people have, uh, have joined hands to, to address a need, a cause and trying to help. Uh, and when our uh, healthcare frontline uh, warriors are being exposed with coronavirus with the lack of a mask, you know, people started building masks. And, uh, you know, we launched our mask building effort just about maybe like uh, two weeks back, uh, two and a half weeks back. And two and a half weeks, we have collected 2,500 masks. You know, I, I still can't believe that how it came about. 
uh, just today, we had a senior from uh, Boulder Creek, actually, who reached out and said, I need help with groceries. Mm -hmm. And we are here in Santa Clara County, and uh, we have enough volunteers now, and we found someone lives in Boulder Creek. We, we called the person, and the person was very much willing and just very enthusiastic about going out and picking up groceries and providing it to this particular senior. So it's pretty amazing. So far, every volunteer, in fact, we have a bot running on our page, which is uh, rishikumar.com slash coronavirus. And this bot is able to provide to us, uh, you know, the, it's able to connect to us, the, the, the senior that needs help with respect to a volunteer. You know, we can quickly search through the bot, we find the person and any person we have reached out has not, has, has, has basically decided, has basically stepped up and done their bit to help out. We had a bunch of seniors who were going out and driving to the Sunnyvale Senior Center to pick up food. And we were looking for Mandarin speaking uh, 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 Chinese Americans uh, who could help these seniors out. And we found like eight or 10 of them that stepped up and said, okay, I'll be there to help out, which is pretty amazing. You know, Lots of very positive stories, but I'm going to summarize in terms of what we discussed today. So, you know, I think I'll, I'll make it really short. We, we need to revamp CDC. You know, there are lots of issues with CDC and our work is cut out for us because we are looking at the next pandemic and how we can address all the different challenges that we are discovering today and some of it that we spoke today. And then we look at a cultural issue, you know, cultural issue with privacy. And that is something is probably the hardest challenge that we have because when I posted this information about uh, the Google application, and the ability to do contact tracing, boom, I heard from quite a few people on my social media, Rishi, this is not right. We need to prevent this because our privacies are going to be trampled upon. But how will we get through this crisis, a future crisis? How will we get the economy back on track? And will that result in the US becoming a third world country? I mean, that's the drastic choice we might have to make to sort of uh, get through these types of situations. The distribution model, you know, I don't think so. We have a good distribution model with, uh, with these masks or even with respect to the, the PPE or with respect to test kits, you know, I, I think that's completely not, not quite uh, uh, squared away and we need to fix that quite a bit. And then let's talk about the social net with healthcare. I mean, that's something that the debate has been happening at the presidential uh, debate stage. We have been talking about it, but it's time we have to move forward. And, uh, and we cannot, like uh, Samira said, we cannot politicize human health. So those are a quick summary of what we talked about. I really appreciate all of you joining us and thank you so much for spending the evening. I would love to see if anybody has any final words that you would like to summarize. So I'll only say one thing that even now and until the foreseeable future, I think the virus is really dictating what we are doing. We don't yet have a full handle on it. Correct. And I think for the next few months, whether or not we are helping each other or not, it's something the virus does. Whether or not you will have some of these our panelists alive uh, three months from now, it's not something that so far the governments have been able to control, except with, without social isolation. So when uh, there's going to be a very complex interplay between uh, the people who are looking for economic um, uh, revitalization versus people who are going to say we want to keep people alive. So that, unless we have a better handle on what, whether we have true immunity, whether or not the test kits are working, whether the tests are reliable, we do not know yet. So I think up till now, the virus really has dictated what has happened and will continue to do so until that situation improves. <laughs> Well said. Well said, Dr. Bell. Anyone else wants to add something? Yes, me. I just want to share something sweet with the, you guys. Uh, today I heard they said there's something missing from the shops and I, it intrigued me. I wanted to know what was that? I mean, it's not toilet paper. It's not something else. I found out it was um, sewing machines. People are buying sewing machines so they can make masks for and give them, uh, help other people to wear them, you know, to use them. So I thought that was really nice uh, gesture from everybody who is trying to help. It's great. Yes, yes. It's bringing out the goodness in people's hearts, for yeah. sure. 
Yeah. Yeah, I had a uh, a friend from high school who I've been talked to in years contact me through Facebook and send me five masks that he made uh, with his 3D printer, which I found amazing. And, um, you know, it is super, super sweet. Helped me reconnect. So. Uh, yeah. All this inside times helped me, helping me reconnect with old, old friends. <laughs> for sure, for sure, yes. And I guess I have some sort of uplifting thing. I think society is now going to change. There have to, instead of um, things being started and changed through the administration, federal or state government, it starts with you as being an individual and, you know, taking for the future now. And as Dr. Fauci says, that handshaking may be a thing of the past and more of a cultural kind of nod or acknowledgement there. And um, I think that that starts. You as an individual have the huge power to change all of this, and it's you who decide how the future is going to be shaped. And so the curve flattening in all sorts of different states and countries is because of the people, not because of government. And so that is a huge, huge thank you to those that are listening out there and that the positivity of everyone trying to stand together, keep people who are not social distancing in check by saying, hey, you guys are too close. Those are the types of people that are going to make our society much better. And so thank you for all of that. Very nicely said, Dr. McCollum. I, I do have uh, something, uh, a follow-up for you, which is your EMS, EMS SM task force. Oh, right. Yes. <laughs> and uh, would you like to share some insights into that? And, and also, you work with uh, you know professionals in the sporting community. Yes. And, and <laughs> so what can I, we I, expect for the upcoming right. season? You know, I, I I completely forgot, but I was very curious. I did want to bring it up. You know. Yes. So um, I will be leaving the state of California. I'll be working for Mayo Clinic as well as Tria Orthopedics. So I'll be working with the U.S. Olympic track and field as wow. well as well as um, the wild which is the hockey team from the nhl and the twins so we have a lot been going into discussions about what goes forth with all these sort of mass gatherings as well as sports that give people that sense of freedom and to forget it all because that is something that we didn't touch upon today, but the social and the mood disorders that go along with isolations and there's something to be happy about seeing your team win or lose as the case may be. And so, you know, Gavin Newsom made an announcement today that he doesn't see any gatherings that are going to happen unless some sort of world sort of easy testing and um, vaccinations can be readily available. And for us as being physicians, part of these organized sports and even on the NCAA level with all these different colleges, that is a huge sort of um, impact to how we are going to go about in making these games available to the public and being able to play safely. And so we're in the process of trying to figure out, you know, what is the best way of resuming that type of life and, you know, falls are, fall season is coming very close. I know that the baseball teams are really trying to figure out what is the best way for them to, you know, start the season. And um, it is a work in progress and we will definitely get there somehow, whether it's the availability of testing and being able to get results right away. And that would lead to being able to have a tele, at least a televised version of these games that we can um, kind of continue from all sorts of different levels. Um, you know, he started talking about schools today and, um, you know, trying to stagger out recesses and lunch times. And, you know, that goes along with also having all these competitions with in tournaments at the high school level at, or, you know, AYSO for the younger kids, you know, that is going to be a huge, huge thing in, in, in growth for their development as well. So we're working very closely and trying to find the best way to return people to sports. So, um, you know, stay tuned for that. Um, and I, you know, I'm pretty positive that, you know, football season will go on and so will hockey. <laughs> so it'll just take some time. So you might see the rise of virtual sports like indoor erging. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Very true. Our, our boys are so much in the NBA and uh, college basketball. They, they were really missing out. And so they started watching ESPN. And I was like, what are you watching? They were actually watching two NBA players who are going head to head 
with uh, NBA 2K. You know, they were playing that basketball game and they were, that was being telecast on, on and they, it was a championship. <laughs> Pretty. Uh, how about uh, Dr. Opelander? Any, any final words? Uh, um, I guess from the preventative standpoint, I'm really hoping people will stick with the going outside and getting some exercise. I see so yes. many more families spending time together um, outside. I mean, you know, when you have to manage your staggered dog walk with the neighborhood, I'm like, wow, this is awesome. All these people are out here getting some exercise. Um, so stuff like that and maybe having more people telecommute and our air will be a little cleaner because they realize they don't have to be in the office every day. I mean, there's small things, but to me, it's like the silver lining out of this really big, horribly scary cloud. Yes, for sure. Dr. Tigliao. Oh, I, I think um, I think it'll be really interesting to see. Uh, you know, sp what I've been more worried about is my kids and, and thinking about how. I mean, my I have three boys that play soccer, and you know, I'm used to spending my weekends on the soccer field watching them play, and they, you know, they play baseball, and you know, and so um, seeing them discover uh, other things like. Um, like for instance, uh, my youngest just started Spanish language <laughs> um, school, and he's he's seven. And so, uh, you know, I, I think it, it's just a really interesting time to to for for our children uh, to be growing up in. And and I think seeing them get through it gives me hope that that we're all going to get through this okay and and better for it, um, having gone through it. Yep. So Dr. Tiglia, we started something which is, uh, we call it shelter in place coding, <laughs> which actually begins uh, next Monday. And we are teaching anybody and everybody. Uh, we have collaborated with a nonprofit. We are teaching Python programming, uh, JavaScripting, and also Java. And we are also teaching them the mechanics <laughs> of rolling out a startup. So it's a Monday through Thursday schedule, an hour each, and we have instructors lined up and they have the curriculum lined up. So it's going to be very interesting to watch all these kids who are sheltered in place and uh, finding an outlet through coding and programming. Pretty geeky stuff, but I think they'll enjoy it. <laughs> well, I think that's that's amazing. That's that's so much fun for them. I mean, just some of the games that they're, you know, some, some, some of the kids, I've seen the kids play are just, I mean, way beyond what I was doing when I was their age. I mean. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Well, thank you all. I really appreciate it. I'm so sorry we ran over by almost like 30 minutes, but it was a really, really good discussion. I'll be sure to send you the video link of this. It'll be on YouTube and it'll also be posted on social media. And, uh, you know, I look forward to staying in touch. Uh, thank you again for spending time. This is the new way of saying hello and goodbye. So thank you. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.